வேணும் உண்டியாடு சொல்ற குடுங்கோண்டா காசு கொடுக்காம கொடுக்கலாம் Hello everyone. Can you start now? Yes, please. Okay. 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 Uh, good day to you all. On behalf of PIFA, Peradini Engineering Faculty Alumni Association, I would like to welcome you all. The speaker first, our exco. and other members and all well wishers uh, and all participants Be before the um, proceedings i would like to uh, uh, introduce what pfi is we are the first alumni association based as a faculty started in 1991 under the patronage of then dean emeritus professor munida sapirana veera uh, we started as a charity organization and now we have extended our services uh, to enhance the capacity in various other sectors not only in sri lanka but globally with a chapter in colombo and overseas uh, as well this event is one such and second in the series of talks planned in the year in this year actually uh, i believe that the restrictions uh, due to covid pandemic we are now reaching every corner of the world through technology earlier instances it was attended by participants who can uh, find time to travel 
uh, to participate physically. Now it is open to public via thanks to uh, Event TV Plus and YouTube too. So today's talk is a much needed one for our fellow engineers, and it will be indeed on a relevant topic of your choice. It's uh, macroeconomic development uh, issues and challenges since liberalization uh, by Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe. So without taking much time to uh, welcome you all, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Shobha Hera, the PIFA secretary, uh, to introduce the speaker today. Over to you, Shobha. Thank you, Leka, for giving me this opportunity to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Today, we launch talk number two of our talk series. Our speaker today is Dr. Nandala Veerasinghe. He will talk on the topic Sri Lanka's macroeconomic development issues and challenges since liberalization. Dr. Veerasinghe served as the senior deputy governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka prior to his retirement early this year. Dr. Veera Singh uh, is, from, uh, is from Southern Sri Lanka, got his primary education uh, from Rahula College, Mother. And then he entered Ananda College for his secondary education. Thereafter, he entered University of Kalania and obtained his BSc honors degree in physical science stream. He obtained his master's and PhD degrees from Australian National University and uh, he has served uh, 29 years uh, long service as a banker. He held several key positions at the central bank before becoming the senior uh, deputy governor and uh, uh, he served as the chief economist, the director of economic research and the deputy governor. Currently, he provides consultancy services to several global companies and multilateral agencies. Not only in banking, he also provides his services to academia as well. He served as a visiting lecturer in postgraduate courses in economics at University of Colombo. He has also served as a visiting research fellow at the Australian National University where he studied. And currently he is based in Australia, serving as a member of advisory board of the Center for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. He has also published several research papers in national and international forums. From 2010 to 2012, he was the alternate executive director of IMF for India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Bhutan, and served as a member of executive board of IMF. It is our privilege to have him here today, joining from Australia to deliver this talk for PIFA members. Without uh, taking much time, I cordially invite Dr. Veera Singh to deliver his talk. Over to you, Dr. Nandala. Thank you very much, uh, Shobha, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank the Alumni Association for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's indeed, uh, uh, great privilege and pleasure to speak to uh, such an intellectual group of people uh, uh, on a subject uh, which is very uh, timely and uh, relevant. Um, and also, uh, I'd like to share a few, uh, I mean, at the beginning, some kind of caveats I have to announce. Uh, basically, this is the first time uh, I'm making a public speech uh, as a private citizen after my early retirement from the central bank uh, from October last year. Uh, in fact, these opinions I express here 
are all based on all publicly available information and it does not contain any or oh, i have not used any confidential information uh, that i had as a senior deputy governor i think i have to uh, uh, express that uh, view at the beginning so i don't intend to use any any that kind of information so all based on publicly uh, available information and also i because this is uh, uh, macroeconomic is a bit of a uh, technical area uh, that basically a lot of people who are learn economists are familiar with but but i understand to the audience uh, especially the uh, the engineering faculty may not be that familiar with that so i'm trying to explain uh, the kind of a technical con concepts as as much as possible in a simple manner so in a lot of other uh, you know the people who are not familiar with the economics again are obviously uh, going to listen to this talk so that's uh, uh, i'll try my best to do that and also the the if you look at the name of the topic it looks like it's going to, i'm going to talk about the history this is not actually so i'm going to talk about the, the some of the episodes uh, that we have experienced in sri lanka since liberalization in 1997 it's only for the purpose of learning some lessons and you know uh we we uh, look at what happened in the history but my topic my talk mainly was especially at the end uh, to the end of the uh, second half will be more focusing on uh, and even uh, uh, from the beginning uh, focusing on current economic situation and the difficulties and kind of crisis that we are facing right now and perhaps uh, and in the end uh, what i see as an economist uh, as some some solutions and way forward so that is basically uh, uh, the the, uh, the the my uh, basic talk uh, will be about and uh, and also i have to say uh, i when you talk about the economy you can uh, and economics i mean you can talk about a lot of areas but here i am going to focus only on as my topic uh, you know, indicate in the case Only on macroeconomic issues uh, and very few macroeconomic issues because given the time limitation, I'm trying to focus on few issues and then try to explain as much as possible what are the issues and challenges and the way forward. Let me first, uh, I mean, with that uh, remarks, uh, let me share my screen. That I have a few slides uh, and but still it is just only for the easy explanation. But this this uh, one doesn't give any uh, kind of a a detail uh, this thing about my talk is people have listened to this uh, and then i i'll be sort of explaining what uh, uh, this uh, implications and we said yes i'm trying to uh, deliver uh, using this uh, presentation so in sense it is some pictures and some few points so the topic uh, as i said uh, uh, overall uh, macroeconomic uh, areas Uh, there are when you talk about the macro, any macroeconomic uh, of the of an country, there are three four areas. What is first one is the economic growth, mm -hmm. and then uh, the external sector of the economy, which is the foreign exchange earnings and expenditure and the uh, reserves that savings that a country has, and then the government operations, what we call fiscal policy and government debt. That is uh, one of the key issues that we are facing right now, and then uh, central bank responsibility, inflation, and monetary policy. So those are the four areas that I am going to focus on. And then from time to time, even while I am talking about all these areas, I I also talk about the issues, challenges uh, uh, within those four areas. So let me first start uh, with uh, economic growth. So why uh, I start with economic growth because economic growth is one of the most important um, economic uh, uh, indicator uh, of an economy, which uh, tells us about the, for example, so if the economic growth is high, it means people's living standards going to be high, people's incomes are going to be high, countries' overall income uh, uh, incomes are going to be high. So likewise, uh, it's a it's a very basic. Indicator of the overall macroeconomy, what we call real GDP growth. GDP is what we call uh, what is produced value add, value added, uh, value addition of a country within one calendar year. 
So if you look at this chart, what I'm trying to uh, show in this chart is that, as I mentioned earlier, 1977 up to 2020, how we have uh, our country has performed in terms of real economic growth uh, by, by real GDP. So when you can see, I mean, I have two periods I have separated here. First one is 1978 to 2009, which is I call as uh, the, uh, the before the uh, kind of uh, the since liberalization and uh, before the end of the war, basically a uh, pre-war period and then post-war period. One uh, observation here I'm making, since the liberalization in 1977 up to 2009, average economic growth has been around 5%. And then after the opening of the, after the end of the war, average growth has come down to 4.5%. I mean, this is completely uh, uh, different from what people believe basically so that after the end of the war, economy had, and in, in fact, it was a belief that the economy was going to grow at even a higher rate after the end of the war. But we look at the actual figures, but we can, what we are seeing is that economy in fact, on average, has grow, grown at a lower rate, not even as much as uh, during the war period uh, since 1970. Obviously, if you look at before 1970, it has been much lower, so the closed economy is about 3.5%. And we are much better during the liberalization up to end of the war. And after the end of the war, I mean, if you look at few periods, just after the end of the war, first couple of years, you can see very high 8% coming growth. Uh, we have a few a couple of years, and then it crashed down. And then after that, from 2013 onwards, it's on average 3%. Uh, 4% and obviously 2020 is a negative growth, which is uh, obviously partly because of the pandemic and partly because of other economic issues. So we have we recorded lows, I mean, highest negative economic growth in 2020. The first time before that we had negative economic growth was in year 2000, where the, uh, a lot of issues when LTT attacked the, uh, our airport, and there are a lot of issues in the balance of payment, uh, all these issues. So that is the only first time before uh, last year we had negative growth. But if you look at some high growth areas, uh, period where just after the economy was opened in 1977, there's about a couple of years, 8% growth. Uh, that's mainly coming from uh, this soon after economy was opened. And there's a kind of a, uh, since the economy was open, then a lot of activities were uh, generating, and also there's a lot of other uh, kind of uh, large development projects like accelerated Mahali uh, development program took place. As I said, there was a period of very high community growth. But the key, uh, I mean, the weakness what we are seeing here is, is not consistent. If you look at China or India, it has been over. 8%, 9%, 10%, or it's even 7% continuous growth for about 20, 30 years. We never had that kind of situation. It's going up, some coming down, a very volatile economic growth. That is one of the reasons why we are still our incomes levels have not been grown as much as like China or, or as much as like a lot of other Asian countries. We are still kind of a middle income uh, category. Uh, the, one of the implications and uh, comparison in the next chart I, I show you is uh, what we call a uh, capita GDP. So I'm sorry, uh, uh, as you can see uh, uh, here, uh, now the, the per capita GDP means what is the average income per person in US dollar terms. So now, uh, starting from 1978, it was very low, and then there's a kind of a period stable, because with high growth and then uh, with a slow growth. And from about 2004, there has been sharp increase in per capita growth up to 2017. And after 2017, obviously, uh, there's a peak there, then it's now turning uh, other way around. So now per capita GDP terms, now our per capita GDP is coming down, from the peak in 2017, now is we are they come down uh, just below 2014 level, and with 2021 growth, uh, it will be even even lower. So what we call this is what we call middle income trap. They are once you come to a certain level of uh, middle income, then to 
take off from that point onwards, you need to have different kind of economic policies, different kind of economic reforms. Without that, economy will be stagnant, and then it will not, not be improving the living standards and uh, economic growth and the well-being of the people. That's what we're experiencing right now from 2017 onwards. It's now turning, turning down and it's continuously uh, going down. So basically, that is one of the challenges that we are facing right now. Uh, in that is all about the uh, real economic. That is one of the important indicators of in countries uh, uh, economy, how it is performing in terms of uh, people's living standard and the, the, the poverty, all these things have an impact on uh, the growth. So then uh, other important, the, the uh, area uh, that I would like to highlight here is the what we call foreign exchange situation of the country. So how, I mean, this first, let me explain in simple terms, this, this two charts, uh, just, to, just for, us, for you to understand what, what does it mean. So first top chart, what, what I say is current account balance of balance as a person of GDP, which, which is, Basically, to take the country, the foreign exchange earnings and the expenditure for the whole country. Uh, in Sri Lanka, I take as a one entity, the Sri Lanka earns foreign exchange in terms of exports, goods and services, and, uh, and remittances, and also spend foreign exchange on import of goods, uh, goods and services. Uh, so then, if you look at the difference between those two, historically, from 1970 so far up to 2020, we always had a deficit there, which means we have been um, spending for an exchange, for an expenditure for an exchange has been much higher than what we earn in for an exchange. That is why current account balance, uh, you can see, is a deficit. So what is the, what are the implications of having a current account deficit running for almost now 30 years? Even if you go back to back in the history, it has only been in 1950s, early 1950s, we had recorded a surplus in the current account, which means we have we had earned more foreign exchange than we spent. That was uh, during the, the what we call a, a commodity boom, rubber, tea rubber oh, prices went up. We had a large good uh, exports, and those days we didn't have much import expenditure, so that we had a surplus, and currency was pretty stable. So when you are running this kind of a you know, it's like if you look at your house expenditure and uh, the income, it's like for last almost 40 years, we have been spending as a country in foreign exchange more than what we earn. Then the first implication, uh, if you look at the uh, value of the rupee, when you have this kind of situation, the first outcome would be value of the rupee would be depreciated uh, as a result of this current country. So if you look at historically 1977, we had US dollar value of a rupee is about 15 rupees. Now, this official so called rate is 202, but no one can find a dollar set 202, is basically 234, like the market rate. So you can see the amount of currency devaluation, depreciation over a period of time as first, there's a first result. And then when you have this kind of a deficit in uh, exchange earnings and expenditure, what you do as a, even if you are household budget, then you have to borrow, or you have to, uh, you know, ask someone to give me some money to finance this deficit, otherwise I, you can't survive. So this is what has happened so historically. Uh, then how we have financed it, they, we have been uh, either uh, taking loans from foreign exchange, in foreign exchange from foreign services, and fill that gap in terms of there are two ways. One is the, we can have investment inflows like foreign direct investment or short term investment like uh, to the stock market or government and others can borrow in foreign exchange. So without that borrowing, so we 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 couldn't we wouldn't be able to fill this deficit and then we will be in a relative crisis. So when you look at very high current account deficits in early 1980s, that's mainly because of the uh, in 1980s, this large development program, Mahavali program, Mahavali Accelerator program, that has a large expenditure by the uh, by the country uh, for next expenditure expenditure. That is why large current fund, largest 16 percent of GDP is a very large current fund. But uh, that time we didn't have much crisis, and I will explain why. And uh, if you look at now, 
our parents want to give us about two to three percent of GDP, but still we are now facing a huge financial crisis. So that is the difference between the crisis, the current country was earlier, and current country we are running now. Let me now explain the chart below, which is has direct link between current one deficit, what we call external reserves. Resource is the stock of countries' savings in foreign exchange. Now, when you look at historically, this is in 1970s, 1980s, we didn't have much reserves. So basically, to look at in terms of US dollars, this, this is uh, millions, uh, uh, millions of US dollars, less than 1,000 million up to 1992. 1,000 million US dollars. But we had high current fund deficit. Then the question is that you know, how we have financed. Basically, when we were running high current exchange expenditure, if someone is giving us money to finance that, then we didn't have a build up so much research. That is why in early 1980s, all this development program was mainly funded by foreign sources like foreign countries uh, at a very concessional loans and grants, say 0% interest and or, or free money. As a result, that was not a burden, and we did not we did not build up a lot of resource at the early stage of large current economy. So that was, and whenever there was a stress on the obvious when we have low resource, then there will be a pressure on the currency to depreciate. Then whenever that happens, government successive governments are going to the IMF and uh, sought their assistance, and then they come and help uh, for member countries, uh, uh, and then they just kind of what we call bailout, and then change the policies. As a result, we, we uh, go back to normal situation. But if you look at recent history from say 2005, six, seven, no, no, sorry. Uh, recent history, we, we lower, this lower current one, degree, but still we have had a much higher levels of reserves. How that, that has happened? Basically here what, what has happened, Although we have been running large current one deficit, I mean, relatively low current deficit compared to the 1980s, but we did not have that much of concessional money coming in. But instead, the government uh, from 2007 started borrowing from commercial markets, like some commercial markets, what we call income and sovereign bonds. And we are, we worked in large, borrowed large amount of foreign currency debt brought into the country yes, and partly that you, that was used to finance with those all the deficits and in mm -hmm. excess that was built up as reserves. Mm -hmm. That's why we have fairly high level of reserves uh, towards the from 2005, 6, 7, mm -hmm. 8 onwards, which basically average because has been about 7 billion, 8 billion high. But and the problem is that even with this kind of level of reserves, we have been having a lot of stress or problems with the, the foreign exchange. If you can remember, just after the end of the war in 2009-10, we had very high economic growth, and 2011, we had a sharp depreciation, and with these kind of reserves, still, uh, we had an issue, then we had to go to the IMF, and then they came and bailed out to help us, and then the uh, situation was uh, brought under control. Then, then I'm trying to explain why the difference between then and now, that is a very important point here, everyone to understand. And this explains uh, the, the, the key part of the, the difference. So why this is the comparison of the resource versus what, what I call debt service payment. So when you take loans uh, by country, you have to repay that with interest. That's what we call debt service payment. You pay capital and also add, add, add on interest. Then if you compare every year, the level of resource is in blue lines. And then uh, the amount of uh, money that we had to pay as debt service payments are the, the red lines. So historically, why we did not have much of a current exchange issue is because, for example, if you even look at 2010, we had 7 billion resources. We had debt service payments uh, annual is about just below uh, you know, 2,000 million, is again 8 billion versus. Two billion. So we had four times of debt service payments as a resource. So basically, then that that will help us. That would help us to finance other additional import expenditure as a what I call a current fund deficit. There's a deficit. There's a there's a need to finance foreign exchange a deficit uh, using our resource uh, at times. Then we have a buffer here. 
So that's why we did not have much of a crisis like what we experienced actually now because we had a sufficient level of financial resource in the past. Uh, then, um, so let me just close I can see. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, uh, if you look at the 2020 situation, the ratio between, so I mean, difference between the level of reserves and debt service payments now declined, gap is reducing. And in 2020, we had resource approved 5 billion and just payments about 4.5 billion. So this is close. And this is a very critical situation. And also, it will get 2021 right now. The situation is even that is why the most critical situation right now in 2021, at this moment, we have based on estimate for Central Bank 2.5 billion reserves. Compared to 4.5 billion debt service payments. So it's completely lopsided uh, the two bars. First time in the history, our level of resource between country savings has come down to $2.5 billion, and our debt service obligations have gone up to similar debt service payments, gone up to $4.5 billion. It is almost a double. So this is a crucial situation, which means money that we have saved as a country is not even sufficient to meet pay our debt in next 12 months. Forget about financing import expenditure, uh, essential imports, petroleum, gas, uh, fertilizer, all these things. Still, money is not enough in our city to meet our debt service payment. That is where right now the crisis, and this has never happened in the history. That is why this situation is much more critical. And this is what is important to understand. It is, we don't think this is a similar situation we had in the past we can handle. It's a completely misunderstanding. This situation we have never had in the past. This is a completely new situation, 2021 especially. And also, this is not a one off situation. Like in the past, it was basically current account. We, we have been importing more than uh, the, the exporting. And we impose restrictions on impose, then they, it will address, and also IMF comes in and gives some money. Then the problem can be solved within six, 12 months. But this situation, if you look at the next four or five years debt service payment, every year we have at least for external sources annual $4.5 billion every year. If you add foreign currency debt service payments, that including uh, dollar debt we have got from local commercial banks. Based on average six billion dollars in next four five years every year. So now we are talking about next four five years we have to pay six billion dollars every year in foreign currency, and now we are having only two point five billion dollars in our city. So that is a crucial situation. That's why you may come to come to this situation. Rating agencies have downgraded to triple which is the lowest ever level, and the, that's why you see a lot of shortage in essential items, for instance, uh, and difficult to find uh, importers to go to the bank and get for an exchange because there's a huge for exchange shortage compared to what we need. In, in, in fact, money that in our city, in, in countries reserves, is not sufficient to meet even debt service payment. Uh, forget about import uh, expenditure uh, over the exports. I mean, that's a difference. There's also a huge gap. So that is where the crisis, and then it's, it's an important point here I want to make here. It is not a temporary short term situation. Uh, it is a, it's going to be there like for five years. So the solution I, I'll talk about later. And basically, if you did not bring uh, increase our level of resource savings up to say every year six billion means we have to have at least at least ten billion, eight billion level of resource every year. Yeah, we should be able to replenish and we should be able to borrow continuously to at least repay our, our debt. Otherwise, we will be defaulting, country will, will be bankrupt. So that is the kind of a situation that we are right now facing. It's a very crucial situation. And why this is a situation? I mean, that if you look at the one of the reasons is uh, Sri Lanka has never been a, a country that has done well in exports of goods and services. This is a comparison. Uh, uh, and this, if you look at the sample of countries that here, if I set 78 as zero, and this is uh, export of goods and services as percentage of GDP of each country, 
you can see the the orange line sri lanka has been the lowest in the queue and india korea malaysia pakistan even pakistan it has been better than philippines thailand that is why in bangladesh that's why those countries are not facing the situation that we are facing so there's a there's a reason for that why because we have been borrowing commercially as well as uncommercial in the past but we have not invested properly that money to generate export earnings so for instance earnings that we have spent that money to spend government expenditure salaries and wages pensions uh, uh, all other expenditure and that that kind of investment by the government uh, has not helped country to increase capacity to export these kind of services this is a different situation in thailand philippine even bangladesh the china uh, the, the korea hong kong all these countries basically they have been they is not not a bad is is taking borrowing is not a bad thing i think it's it's essential for a country question is that probably said if you borrow you need to invest in an areas where that that is generate return and high return as well as generate or increase the capacity of country to earn for an exchange if you invest money invest in uh, borrowing dollars and invest in uh, areas where that that does not in 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 rupee income areas and he has huge mismatch and they are, it is not sustain that is one of the reason why we are facing this situation right now and if you look at as i mentioned earlier how we have been surviving so far the last amount of current account deficit even in the past the last 35 years is it has been the government Uh, which has been borrowing heavily from abroad. If you look at the the, the purple uh, bars, are uh, government borrowings to finance current account deficit, external current account deficit. Government has been borrowing heavily, and uh, they spending that money for local expenditure. And as a result, uh, the government has is in a debt situation, but country has not been able to generate financial income to service that external debt. That is the uh, the crisis that we are facing right now. and one other way and better way to uh, uh, the finance uh, uh, this uh, current one degree is other ones for indirect investment those are loan term investments and even there we have been, we have performed very poorly if you look at the comparison from this sample of countries sri lanka is, is moving very low as a percent of gdp is maximum up 2% of gdp and it has never gone beyond that is moving very low levels in last 30 40 years it has been we have never been able to attract large amount of foreign direct investment like in india like in vietnam like in bangladesh like in china so that is one of the reason why it's only borrowings that has been able to finance uh, our current fund deficit but borrowings has a limit and unless we generate sufficient income so that is the uh, uh, so then when when you look at what is the root cause of this situation is basically I and mean, a lot of people think it is because sri lankans are importing a lot they they are they their lifestyles are different you know they they want to all for in good it is not the situation I and mean, it's a uh, people choice is always there are better goods they they obviously want to consume that that no one can prevent that but this current account deficit this is a very important chart what have uh, the plotted here is the what i called earlier current account deficit and the fiscal deficit fiscal deficit is government ex- deficit between government income and expenditure so earlier blue line is a whole country for an exchange deficit the the orange line is if you take government as separate entity a uh, separate uh, person government's deficit government income versus expenditure so when you look at the even government deficit has been much higher than the country's current account deficit as a percent of gdp uh, and so here there is a very clear empirical evidence and it has been proven everywhere uh, in even in literature in economics the when a country running a large fiscal deficit for long periods that is the root cause of this foreign exchange deficit in the country so is now if we don't understand that I and mean, this is the root cause if we don't address the root cause then we will ever every time we are having this kind of financial crisis the root cause is that government spend way too much 
then government earning as government revenue, tax income, whatever government income, tax income. Uh, expenditure, all the expenditure, salaries, wages, uh, investment, uh, roads, health, education, all the expenditure. A lot of countries have this kind of rules. Government, when government spend, government has a rule. So you can't, government cannot spend more than 3% of GDP in, in a financial year. Uh, if that if that exceeds, they go to have the parliament or they have to bring in certain measures to con control that. That is the reason why just to prevent foreign exchange prices, that is the way to do that. But we never, I mean, in our, uh, we have never understood this, and basically a lot of people would not accept that. And as a result, this is going on. And as long as you hear the point is that as long as government is running large deficits in their income and expenditure, this foreign exchange prices will ever be there. So the, there's no point of uh, input, having import, controls on imports, no point of having the currency depreciation, no point of having uh, the capital account restrictions without addressing the root cause, which is the fiscal deficit, high large and high fiscal government deficits in terms of income and expenditure. So let's go in, into detail. Then. So this one key reason is the low and declining fiscal revenue. So if you look at the government spend, uh, government income, back in 1978, uh, our government income was 24% of GDP. And it came down in 2013, still coming down to 11.6%. It is less than half. And then uh, even below 10%. And then the, obviously there was some revenue reforms introduced in 2016 and 17. As a result, it went back to close to 14%, somewhere back in 2017-18. But with the recent in 2020 drastic tax cuts for corporates and high income people, it has now below 9%. It's the historical lowest government revenue, 9% of GDP now in 2021. 20, uh, and look at the expenditure is now almost more than double. Its expenditure is close to 18 or 19 percent of GDP. Now think about any you know, if you look at your household budget, you earn 100 rupees and you spend 200 rupees for next uh, in last let's say for five years. What will happen? You obviously will have to sell your house or you have to sell whatever the assets you have, right to sell. Still, that is not sufficient, then you will be back up and you will be prices. So, this is what the current government and this is not that not only not on this government, it's a trend. successive government has been running the deficit, but it has now been worse in, from 2020 or not because of the drastic tax cuts and the tax was reduced significantly. And as a result, government lost revenue. And then, as a result, now the government has a running large fiscal deficit. And then it will it will spill over to large current fund deposits, and then it will create a foreign exchange prices and shortage in balance of the foreign exchange that you never stop unless you address the root cause. That is where uh, the point that I'm trying to make here. And obviously, uh, the strategy by of the, uh, the treasury all the time is that they estimate. If you look at the the budget is announced every year, they say next year government revenue will be you know, this two trillion rupees. But in them, they, 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 they raise only 1.5 trillion. So this KPI has been, uh, the target has always been reached, has not been able to reach. And then then all what they can do, what they would do under the law is that we go to the parliament and this is a budget is a document of the parliament. Go back to the parliament and, and explain, oh, these are the reasons why we could not do. And then, so we, so what to do? We will borrow more to finance that debt. So then you increase your stock of debt. So uh, and also the lot of issues with the revenue administration measures, collections, tax level, all are very weak. So as a result, government is is kind of a, a kind kind of a the person who is spending two hundred rupees and earning hundred rupees, and then it is not sustainable situation. And then the, uh, the and I come to that later. How do you feel the government? Luckily, government has this one. What is authority or privilege like everyone else that we don't have? Government can print money. Government can ask central bank to print money and give me that hundred rupees. So I have expended two hundred. 
my row is only 100. Then there's a 100 gap. Please print 100 rupees for me by the central bank. And then I can balance the budget. So then, the, the, then everyone understands the repercussions of printing excessive money is a completely different thing. And that, can, that will trigger more balance of payment prices. That will trigger more inflation going forward. And that will make lives much difficult for the general public and especially low income and poor people. So that is uh, the point that I want to make here. And, and this is an expenditure. I mean, that's, that's very difficult to, I mean, one can argue well, if the revenue is 100, why don't you cut the expenditure to 100? It's not possible because if you look at the size of the government, the salaries and wages, interest payments, and sorry, the pension subsidies, all these things are about 80% of expenditure. There's no way to cut that. So people are get, are get, have get, got used to those things and it's difficult to cut. No government can cut that kind of expenditure and cannot bring down. That is why while maintaining expenditure under control, you need to raise, you need to raise revenue. Without that, the government budget is uh, bringing to at least a certain sustainable level. This, this can't go on. Uh, like what in the last 30, 40 years, we have been able to do that with, with some of the foreign money uh, borrowing, but now no longer this can be done because now we don't have access to foreign money. Sri Lanka cannot borrow. We are, we are now a uh, triple C traded country. No one is willing to lend us money. So we are like, a, like if you are look at the company, your name is in the trip. Your name is a trip, you can't go to a bank and uh, uh, borrow any, anymore. The bank say, okay, you are, you are a bad, uh, bad borrower. You are, not, you are no longer uh, going to give you money anymore. This is the situation right now we are facing. And as a result, uh, so we are in the, then let me look at uh, the situation that debt situation. So this is the debt. This is in all in rupee term. You can see this is on government debt. Uh, you know, mind you, this is not the so UNI, uh, the, the loans that we had taken from the banks. This is only government loans. Uh, if you look at um, in 2000, just in 2004, that just cost. Two trillion, the debt stock in 2004. Now we are by 2020, it's 15 trillion, and and right now we are actually the 16 trillion. So it's eight times the debt stock from 2003 to now in the last 17 or 16 years. So look at the, the this is in rupees million. So that one can say okay, this is on nominal terms rupees million. Who cares if rupees? High inflation and high currency depreciation, rupee value is anyway will we'll go. Then, then look at the better way to look at the debt is debt as a percentage percent of GDP. So this is where the, the total, the blue black lines are the uh, and the total government debt as a percent of GDP, and the other two lines, red ones. Uh, Much lower than the result we had. So uh, even though we had we had uh, debt as a percent with more than hundred percent, it is uh, not a good level. But still, we were able to manage. We sometimes go to the IMF and uh, seek some assistance and so can solution help. Now debt as a percent GDP is already above hundred. And to to into an amateur, it will record the whole historical records as a, even as a percent of GDP. Not only that, I mean, earlier we had more than 100% GDP, but we were able to manage because we had sufficient resource. But this time, uh, I mean, this is a root cause. Uh, we were, we are, we are not being, this is if you look at the composition of concessional and non concessional loan as a percent of foreign debt. So if you look at foreign debt as 100, in 2000, it's only 1% were commercial. Commercial debt means you go to market, go to foreign market, raise it at about 6-7% for 
for annum for about up to 10 years. And the concession remains, you borrow at uh, 0 to 1%, if you want to pay it at 30, 40 years, so then it's an easily payable debt. So it's not a huge debt burden. But that has now be, has been changed over a period of time, starting from, you can see from 2007, that's where we first started to raise large amounts of commercial debt from foreign countries, or foreign uh, sources. We have first 500 million issuance uh, in 2007. From that point on, uh, continuously, the commercial debt part has been taken over the concessional part. So when you when you have a higher share of commercial debt, between every year debt service payment, interest and the capital payments are also much higher. This is where now commercial debt component has grown about 50%, concessional debt has come down below 50%. And as a result, our debt service payments are now much higher than the results that we have. That is the situation right now, that is the crisis situation that I'm trying to explain. And this is, again, I'm showing this chart. As a result of this earlier, this kind of a, I mean, uh, again, I, I must mention here, borrowing is not a bad thing. Even commercial borrowing is, is necessary. Uh, because otherwise, if commercial borrowing, we wouldn't be able to even meet the service payments in the last couple of years. If we did not borrow from commercial sources, we would have defaulted much earlier. Because we have been borrowing and meeting, you know, we borrow to pay, pay, pay earlier loans. That's what, that is a cycle that has been happening for the last several years. That's how we have been surviving and maintaining some level of results. Now, the problem is that when you borrow for important exchange, if you did not invest that money properly to generate production income, then you are in a trouble. So you borrow in dollars, but that investment in dollars, if that is not going to generate income in dollars like tourism or whatever the exports, then you are you are not you will not be able to meet your debt service payments. It's like you take a home, a home loan, and then you don't have sufficient income to make that service payment. So then you will be bankrupt. This is the situation right now. And if the, yeah, the problems, as I mentioned earlier. All the money, mainly the government has been borrowing and has been investing in local kind of expenditure that would not generate foreign exchange earnings. As a result, there's a huge mismatch. The country has, country's capacity to earn foreign exchange has not been enhanced to the extent that we have borrowed in foreign exchange. And now we are facing uh, the difficult situation here. This is a, this is a completely different situation. And this is again, I'm showing this chart because this, crucial situation is not like what happened in the whole history. It's not like what we, what, how we manage this kind of difficult situation in the, in the past. This is a completely different situation. This time, our level of resource in 2021, you look at the blue line, blue line is 2.5 billion versus red line is 6 billion. So we are in a completely lopsided, this bar chart, first time, since independence is where the major issue that that if we if we if we, if we, if we, if we this is not understood properly, there will be no solution uh, to the current foreign uh, exchange uh, crisis. And th this is all about uh, the external resource debt situation. Let me also talk a little bit about the the central bank so that is uh, the inflation and monetary policy. That is basically the bread and butter of what I have been central bank of. Uh, last 29 years and last part of my career at the senior level basically was involved in monetary policy and I, mean, I should talk about this and if you look at inflation so why inflation is one of the key variable that is important uh, that's one of the important macroeconomic variables why that's important is that because if inflation is high people cost of living is going to be high people can't do business properly inflation is high they can't uh, we, that's why the, uh, any country would like to maintain a low and stable inflation. The responsibility of maintaining low and stable inflation is always the central bank, uh, monetary authority, responsibility. No one else can do that because inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It is all related to money. If central bank is producing a lot more money, then you can't, central bank can't control inflation. That's why the controlling inflation has been vested with the central banks. 
if you look at sri lanka's experience historically from 1977 up to 2009 inflation has been very volatile and if you look at in early 80s it has gone up to 28 percent at some point that is the period where as a huge expenditure by the government especially even the development expenditure like mahavali project at that period get a lot of money pumped by the government to the economy as a result inflation uh, Sort of took twenty. That's why, and as a result, when inflation goes up, currency to be value also goes down. And we have never had until two thousand nine very volatile and average inflation from seven to eight two thousand nine has been twelve percent. But if you look at beyond two thousand nine to last ten twelve years, the government has been able to implement certain kind of multiple strategy where we were able to bring down inflation to around. Between mid single digit, about average five to six percent, at least five percent. If you look at average, is around five percent. Compared to twelve percent before nearly two thousand nine three uh, war period. Now we we have been able to maintain. Selva has been able to maintain inflation around five percent. That is kind of a, I would say achievement by central bank uh, with a lot of effort. Despite this, some government spending a lot of money, but still central bank has been able to maintain inflation. At a kind of a stable level, although there have been highs and lows, but not as much as more than ten percent never uh, from two thousand nine onwards, and also on average it is stable. But now there is a threat now. The way the money has is being printed now by the central bank. When you look at historically, we saw there has been excessive printing of money as a result. As part of the story is that interest has been going up, but so far and last couple of years. Multiple strategy has been to control that, and as a result, we have been able to maintain inflation. I mean, this is a different uh, talk. I mean, if we want to talk about multiple side, I can talk. About, have a different talk. It's a very long story, but I I make it very short. And then the only few comments I have on the current bond policy is that first one I made always point the inflation have been set by we will maintain single digit inflation for an average five percent. That is commendable. How how you now? There's a serious threat to this inflation, with record level of money printed by central bank to finance government budget. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, last year, 2020 and 2021 so far, the average amount of money printed by the central bank to finance budget is around average 800 billion dollars, so 900 billion dollars this year. It is like almost equivalent to government revenue. As I mentioned earlier, government Revenue is hundred, so we have printed another hundred to meet government spending of two hundred. That's the historically highest levels, and we only luckily, the because of the COVID situation, there's not much economic activities. As a result, still people do not feel the impact of the high level of money printing. So that once all that situation is done, economy back comes back to normal, you will see inflation skyrocketing, and this. Below 10% level, it is highly unlikely that that will decrease. And first time in 12 years, inflation is going to be higher than what we. But even now, people are complaining about high cost of living. It, it will be even higher if that continues at this level of printing money. Now, obviously, there was a good uh, move uh, last week by the central bank. They tightened the monetary policy, but in my view, that is one is uh, too late and too little. So this. And the, as Central Bank mentioned, it is to address external situation. It is never happen. It can never happen. No, in various in interest rates to address extended. It has, it has been tried earlier in 2000 also. It has never happened. If you can remember in year 2000, Central Bank raised policy interest rates up to 22 percent, but still Central Bank could not stop the declining reserve. And ultimately, central bank allow exchange rate to be flexible and floated. Then only that bleeding stop, and as a result, we were able to preserve for exchange rate that country had. So, in addition, now even though central bank recently raised interest rates, a lot of indicators of money printing will still continue. Central bank will continue to print money to finance budget deficit because government is not getting sufficient income. 
they, they, they don't have enough money to uh, meet the expenditure. Central bank, even at high interest rates, it will be worst case. Government interest costs will be higher. Still, central bank will be printing money, and that will have implications on everyone. And then, uh, then it, it will be a, a situation uh, worse than what we are. And it's, it's not a bad uh, policy. At least started to tighten, but in my view, it's too late and too late. And this is where I think, the, my view, the monetary policy tightening alone cannot prevent the impending crisis without addressing the root cause, which is unsustainable fiscal policy. If that is not addressed, there's no point of having soft strong Bangladesh or China, no point of having import controls, no point of having the, the restriction on imports or fertilizer or anything. Country is going to face a much more uh, difficult kind of situation if that situation is not private. Basically, the main one is the too low taxes from the rich and who are paying more, who are paying the taxes in terms of indirect taxes, which companies, if you look at the, uh, the company profit uh, in listed companies announcement of profit and dividends this year, despite the pandemic, they have been recording record profits. How come that happen? It's basically one is that because of the lower taxes, their profit has been higher, that is taxpayers' money. Poor people have been funding the large profits of the corporates and uh, high income people, one. Second, the cost of finance. Interest rates have been suppressed and low and well below. So who is funding the, the as a result, companies are making a lot more profits. Their profits are higher, one other reason. One is a low tax regime, other one is the low interest cost. Who is paying for low interest cost? It's the depositors. Pensioners, seniors, poor people deposits can see the, how much interest that banks are now paying. That is because the interest rates were too low and companies are enjoying very low interest rate regime and their profits are higher. So basically this has been funded partly by taxpayers like most poor people and partly by the, the, these people's savings in the banks in terms of low interest income. Then one can understand why teachers are protesting. It's not because of the, I mean, you can see, it's a protein not because uh, all these anomalies, it, it has been there for several years, why they are protesting. So they feel the, the difficulty in living with that kind of income. When the, when the vaccination is over and economy come back to normal, you can see this kind of fixed income wages Earners will come into the roads, will, will be protesting more, asking for more wages because no one can live out of this with this kind of money printing going on. And there will be high inflation. And obviously, uh, the last two slides, uh, let me just, Susan Tennyson, uh, just let you know about some, some records so far in 2021 in terms of economic management. First one, as I mentioned already, our resource position, external resource our savings of the country in foreign exchange has become lower than external reserves of liquidity. This is the first time in the history. That is one record. Second, the largest fiscal deficit in fiscal account, government revenue expenditure deficit, has been highest since early 1980s. So 1980s, that was because of the very high expenditure for the Mahali development, actually, that, that kind of investment purpose. But those days, it was sustainable because those that deficit was financed by foreign exchange, you know, grants and loans coming at concerned rates from foreign sources. That was basically managed. Whereas now, the, this kind of even large currency industries are financed by printing money by the central bank. That is not the best way to find. I mean, there's a worst way to finance current funds. This is the second report. And third one is, as I mentioned, the, this is the largest ever amount of money to by central bank finance on in the history. And that is the root cause of current foreign exchange crisis. I mean, people say it's a failure of the central bank to manage the foreign exchange. No, the central bank can never manage the foreign exchange exchange rate this way, as long as government is running this high fiscal deficit, and as long as government is printing so much of money to finance the deficit. And the fourth record. Is we have four rating, rating agencies. We started, I think, back in 2007 to rating agencies started. 
right in siddhanta the first prime all the three great agencies moody's snp and fitch they have put us to triple c level so if you look at you can understand trading you start from triple a double a a then double b triple b b then then c c like c double c triple c now we are in triple c so this is the lowest ever level and it is is just above just one below default once we default then we will be even below triple c it is a no one will look at sri lanka no one then when there is a country at this kind of rating even for us to meet the search even we can never you know access we can we can't go and borrow from our out external also because no one is willing to lend it's like as i said earlier we our your name is in the crib so there no bank uh, is willing to lend uh, when your name is in the crib it's like uh, we, we are the country's uh, country's name is in the crib uh, globally and then uh, no country or no, no agency is willing to lend us money unless the official sources like i mean for bank and the fifth record the first time in the central bank central bank is now publishing google section right as of its election and as a result you know if you look at what is publishing last several months the even now the election rate is 202 something that i i i i basically i mean if there's anyone who can go to bank and buy dollars at 202 in a large amount to import anything is impossible is 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 a central bank has never published this kind of bogus section right in the past it is as damage the credibility of data and no one is going to believe they to publish to a central bank when they are publishing the global section rate as officially this 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 section rate is only valid for the government to buy for an exchange from the central bank that is again a subsidy of printing money uh, by the central bank uh, uh, to to uh, meet government external debt service payment and they can buy at 202 only to the government but no one can no one else can buy So this is a market rate. This uh, that informal market is 240 something. So some banks are selling at 215, 20 now. There's nothing called this. Uh, this is a, a wrong exchange rate, and this is, is a damage rate with the central bank. So those are the issues. And then let me. I mean, then the, then obviously those are records already broken in 2021. That then let me just indicate to what will be broken if this continues. The subject, remember. if this continues without changing the course there will be lot more records within pretty soon one is our government will default for in kind of state of the first time we have never ever default sri lanka has a good track record of meeting debt obligation to the debt uh, to the dot every time so far in the history but if it continues this way sri lanka will not be able to at some point in the near future sri lanka government will have default then we will be below triple c that is one thing when that happens and you know it's already happening currency will depreciate at a sharp rate this is is not going to be 202 20 15 market rate is now 240 you will need adjustment you can go for it and other one this as i mentioned earlier but we had almost 12 years of single digit inflation 5 6 percent inflation if this kind of money printing continues that will be soon that it will be reached uh, within next year or what what are the results of that outcome of how people uh, would feel that can you converse depreciate at high rate and inflation is higher then cost of living is likely is already rising but it's likely to rise sharply making essential goods and services unaffordable to large at least is going to affect more or poor people more than you know high income uh, net worth individual business people it is more of the like fixed fixed income earners low income earners pensioners senior citizens they will not be able to afford essential food items and uh, the pharmaceutical if that continues if that continues so that that's an important caveat and also the last one the, what could happen the another report even petrol is already there are restrictions on import of gas and pharmaceutical and petrol is still coming in Some essential food that are still coming in, we will come to a situation. We will, as I mentioned earlier, 
our resources are not sufficient to even to their service payments, we will not be able to import even essential items. And we will be like what we experienced. And if you can remember people who lived that time before 1977, the severe restriction on essential import uh, imported goods, we will go back to that kind of regime if that continues. So that is subject to obviously that can. So then last slide. I mean, it's not fair that I share with you all the negative stories. I think I should, there's, there's a way out and what is what our solution. I will talk only what short term solution because this is an immediate short term issue. No point of talking long term, we have to live short term. If we live through this crisis and then well, let's talk about what other, other things that we can do to address all this issue. In the short term, the only thing, I mean, to me, I mean, this, uh, get out of this crisis is to seek international motor fund assistance. Like I have done in the past, but this is different this time. In my view, it's already too late to seek IMF assistance. And uh, it's too late to prevent the crisis, but the IMF assistance facility can minimize the damage. It can only minimize the damage. They delay the, uh, the seeking IMF assistance, then the damage will be more. So that is one point I want to make. And also, a lot of people say that, you know, we should not IMF with something that they are imposing conditions and, you know, uh, is not is bad for the country. But I think uh, we, IMF is an institution that was established for this purpose. Like, if for any country is facing for anything crisis, the mandate is to help those countries. Obviously, when they give money, it's like a bank you have to comply to a certain conditions. I mean, they say, okay, we will give you money, but you have to correct what you have done wrong. But otherwise, we, they will be wasting their own money. So that, that won't, in not, any bank won't do that. As a result, uh, there's no other choice. I mean, we could have I mean, yeah, prevented, I mean, not going to the IMF if we did what we, we are supposed to do earlier. Uh, if we started doing about six or nine months or one year ago, then we have sufficient time to adjust ourselves. And without going to them, we could have done by ourselves and increase confidence and we investors will come in and use investors and we would have gone to the market and raise money. But now it is too late. It's only the solution is IMF. And IMF has an obligation to assist member countries. We also member countries, we have right, we have we have the right to seek assistance. So no other country has that obligation, even China, India, US, so European countries, they have never ever bailed out in, country, in this kind of situation. They are not, they have no capacity, they will not do that. That is not their mandate. This individual country's mandate is not to bail out country. It's only the IMF officially they bail out country. And you should look at the, I mean, the, the WHO, when they ask the health crisis, people listen to WHO advice. Why is that? Because WHO has the expertise in health issues. They do research, they collect information from all the member countries, and they, they, have, they have the best information on how to address the pandemic or health issues. That's why countries are listening to WHO address in managing pandemic. It's similar. IMF is, is something similar in globally to address connection crisis. So they have experience. They, they will tell us this happened to some other country, this is how they address. So they do also do the same thing. I mean, if we if we're not willing to listen and take expert advice, then we have to go on our way. It's like if we don't listen to WHO advice on pandemic, then we have to have our own local uh, all kind of things uh, to address that. But that will that succeed? I and mean, this is unlikely. So this is a this is a, a analogy, a comparison, and the argument that why. We, we should seek climate reason because of their expertise in handling this kind of situation. So we, we should benefit as a member country. And also they, they, when they give financial assistance, a lot of other, and the second point is that if they come in as assistance, and there will be a lot of governments, even China, India, and World Bank, ATP, all the other, Japan, China, they also will come and support to bail out this country. Without that kind of endorsement, no one is willing to I mean, help Sri Lanka because they need some kind of independent assurance by a institution like IMF that we are doing right things. Without that, no one will come and tender, especially when we are in a triple city. 
And obviously, this kind, why, why I say this kind is different. It's, it's unlike that we, when we went to IMF earlier, we wrote a minister write a letter uh, to the managing director. Within two, three months, we negotiate programs, they give us money, then problem can be solved within six months. But this is a different situation. That's why, as I explained, this is a debt crisis. The earlier we had current account, that was the payment for a thing crisis. It's a debt crisis. We have to restructure it. So if we have debt obligation six billion every year, it is not going to go away this year. It's not going to go away next year. It's not going to go away year after. You need to. It's like when you can't make your loan repay to the bank, you go to the bank and ask, them, "Give me some more time." If a five-year loan, you please make it ten years. Then I should be. I will be able to. Uh, I'll be able to pay. Likewise, we have to without reprofiling. Restructuring our debt obligation, six billion a year for next couple of years. No one, even IMF or other countries, money will not be sufficient to meet our debt obligation. That is the first important part. We have to reprofile and restructure debt. It takes long time. That is why it is too. My, my point is too late because it's not like earlier situation. You go write a letter when IMF comes here and then negotiate a policy, then you get money. It is not like that this time. First thing, IMF, even IMF cannot lend to a member country if they see our debt is not sustainable. First, we have to negotiate with our creditors and make it sustainable by asking for more time, maturity extended, more time, then only they can do money. So that is a long process. And there are a few countries that have, have been done that, only two or three countries uh, during this pandemic period. It's a very long, painful process. So that's why yeah, my, my concern is that we don't have sufficient buffer resource to sustain that period. That's why it's difficult for, it's, 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 anyway, it's too late to prevent a crisis or before. But still, we can minimize the damage. In the country, there's a hope of uh, that on Sri Lanka is now Turn around so we can invest, we can lend them money with no condition. So we can, uh, we can basically, you know, uh, try to uh, manage the situation. And the, the obvious last point the, the argument that, you know, these are all painful response. I mean, if you come and have a lot of pain on people. So my point is that obviously, this situation obviously requires some painful response. So the with time, without time, if we don't do, if we do not adjust current tax policies, if we do not stop print, sorry, if we do not stop printing money uh, excessively, if we do not reform some large loss making state enterprises like CPC, CEB, uh, uh, Sri Lankan Airlines, if we do not release our external debt, then we will have more pain than we are going to die. So, IMF solution would be much better solution. Then going through an even much more painful process, everyone will suffer. There will be a lot of issues, social and economic issues in the country. So that's where I think uh, the, this is a short term solution and this is an immediate thing that authorities will do. Without that, I think I can tell you we will be in much more difficult situation going forward. So the conclusion. I mean, I'm very sorry that I, I don't have a very positive story, but it's my duty as a, a person who has some knowledge and exposure in this area to tell the truth to the public. That's why first time I thought, I express my ideas that I, I came from speaking to the public and I thank uh, the Vera University in faculty uh, alumni association to give me opportunity. I think I gave me opportunity to express my views and this all just to for the knowledge of the general public and then obviously the message hopefully we will go through. Thank you very much. Then question time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Virasimha. Uh, actually, I will invite uh, engineer Numan Marikar to uh, conduct the moderate the question session. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Marikar. Thank you, Dr. Soba. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nandra Virasinghe. In fact, uh, I had a little opportunity to associate with him when you were in uh, Central Bank uh, 
uh, when I was uh, involving in the power sector it, uh, in our Lagdani company. Uh, in negotiating of the power purchase agreement, of course, on the two different sides. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, um, uh, this topic, I guess, uh, is one of the very, very timely and important topic. And uh, I'm very pleased and thankful that you were very informative presentation, which is extremely intellectual. And, uh, and I think uh, sometimes that we engineers most of the time uh, deal with these technical things and I like to listen to technical things, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> that, is, that has been the kind of the education and the practice, but this is a uh, very, very timely and it has uh, the topic Sri Lanka's macroeconomic development issues, challenges, since liberation is not only for professionals, it's I think every person in the country, every citizen is uh, uh, affected or been uh, getting uh, uh, getting feel of about this topic. So, and uh, uh, so much of uh, uh, information in the slides. So I would also like uh, so a few few things very important maybe uh, that. As you said, the real GDP growth, I don't know why you mentioned real. Usually we hear from the from everywhere it's a GDP growth. Perhaps maybe the, this is the, 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 the right, right numbers. So it's since 2012 uh, and to 2020, between this eight period, we have a sharp drop from 8% to minus 4%. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the central bank issued report about two two three days ago it's very strange to see that uh, the prediction for uh, uh, next quarter or 2021 q1 they say it's about 4.3 percent mm -hmm. and it has gone up from minus 3.6 percent to 4.3 percent overall gdp and with with uh, and, uh, increase in every sectors like agriculture, industry, and service, and various sectors. So I, I, I'm not sure whether uh, the, the numbers uh, match with the real GDP numbers. That's one of the observations I, I thought because this mess in this uh, report was released by Central Bank about a few days ago. Yes. Then uh, also, uh, there was another nice slide that we saw that exports of goods and services. Since 1978, which you took as a hundred as the base uh, base point, and up to 2019 period, uh, it has come down to about 100% uh, come down to approximately about 60%. Mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, rather think in like you know as engineers also we might have not had enough contribution to bring up our. Uh, these goods and services uh, exports increased because we we engineers have a very big role because we cannot just uh, just uh, just uh, do our day to day activities and do a kind of a management activities and wait because it's a exports and the services that goes together and the exports can be created with the technology involvement mm -hmm. and the we engineers really have some contribution to in that. I don't know whether as we PIFA, the Engineers Association should feel that uh, or bring that into our members to say that uh, by looking at these numbers itself, we show that we haven't contributed to the uh, country's economy. That's what my personal feeling. I think we should uh, recently have said maybe Dr. Nandra have uh, some other observation. You may, you may uh, explain that uh, and also other slides, what you saw is like, you know, our government revenue of the GDP has gone uh, from 1978, 24% to reduce to 11%. That, that, that tells the story. <laughs> that's a, that's tells the story where, where we are today. And uh, it has been accumulated all this period of time. So with all this kind of a very informative information, may I uh, get uh, one or two questions to you? which uh, there are a few questions, but in the meantime, some of the points that I would like to uh, raise. Now we hear from the central bank, a uh, lot of controls are being introduced. And uh, as, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, 
engineer and the, uh, the, the manager involved in this kind of uh, uh, capital investments, we also find extremely difficult situation now because uh, we can't open LCs. Yeah. And uh, for our manufacturing, we can't import uh, raw materials and those are being held up. And sometimes some of the some of the uh, conditions the bank says to us uh, very very strange, and they say, okay, why do you want to sell some of your shares to overseas uh, <laughs> investors and bring dollars? And for that amount of the dollars, we we'll let you to open LCs. These are the, these are the facts that. <laughs> I mean, <Yes>. we are hearing. <laughs> these, these are the kind of new approaches what we see like even divest our uh, assets of the company shares to bring foreign oh, exchange yes. and uh, I don't know whether it can solve the problem but even even for uh, uh, there are companies who bring uh, foreign exchange and they they are they, they ask to even the central bank says you borrow in rupees mm -hmm. and uh, keep your dollars but nevertheless, still without importance and raw material, we can't uh, do business. So uh, <clears throat> these controls will have probably a short-term thing. So I would like to you know your, your expert uh, opinion on that. That's a number one. And then <laughs> number two is uh, again, uh, our state minister and the former uh, central bank governor very recently last week said that there is about $2.6 billion uh, expecting the various kinds of SOPs and you know IMF something and also some making some uh, uh, non-income in, uh, generating investments uh, to make uh, you know I think uh, I think it's 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 a sale of uh, sale of shares or the sale of assets otherwise uh, I, I didn't see any any other thing that can come in so whether this kind of 2.6 billion in a very short period is practically possible with these current ratings which we have gone down from 2017 it was a b minus and now b minus now b minus or b plus now we are at uh, c okay. yeah so the four years has gone down so whether it is possible to do something like that and then another then the beautiful thing that you noted all the banks in Sri Lanka, the last year's uh, last last week's uh, came out the figures. All the banks in Sri Lanka are making huge profits, and the profitability is shown at a high percentage, 50, 60, 70 percent. And uh, but they are hiding their share value, so less than 50 percent of the their net worth. But uh, I'm not sure why these kind of uh, uh, numbers are being put out for a public to mislead or whether there is no any central bank kind of authority to control these uh, uh, misinformation because uh, you can just show a figure we are making a profit, but actually uh, the, the bank's networks are going down. So it, it may be a different way. So, so these are the few things that I thought. Any anyway, once again, Thank you so much for your informative uh, presentation. There are a few more questions we will take after this. Yeah, I think yeah, you face a lot of uh, <laughs> questions and obviously those are um, very, very well, I mean, everyone aware of this, all the issues. But yeah, I, I, as a, uh, I mean, uh, as a non-official now, I think I do not want to, Comments on certain things that you basically you know what the state minister said uh, whether this is feasible or not because I don't have that information to tell you whether this is feasible or not because that they may have plans but obviously what I can read is that this kind of solutions are not sustainable say so from India so from Bangladesh uh, short term money from somewhere else is not going to solve this problem that's why my clear, uh, clear message here is that the root cause is different. Now, when you have root cause as a government fiscal operations, and while keeping that address in third that root cause there, cutting up, you know, bringing 250 million from Bangladesh, another 300 million from China, when you have 6 billion debt obligations, it's not going to solve all the, all the short term money, even though, I mean, even if that money comes in, but to pay back in within the next 6 12 months. 
So that was the point of having that money. I mean, then again, you are back to square, even if that comes in. I, I don't want to comment on whether that is feasible or not. That probably government has no information. I don't have that information uh, to tell you. But the other point that you raised from the central bank projections of 5%, I think uh, is, is, is probably feasible given that you see last year, last, I mean, this is a point, uh, to 2020, I think Q2, economy contracted by 16%. It is like you at 100, you came down to 86. Now we said you've grown by under five. You, you, it is come, coming to 91, but it, 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 it's not, not going to come to back the level that we had earlier. Still, we are below. But if you look at last year, this year, it, it could be seen as a growth, whether it's 5% or 2%, people, that is debatable. Right now, yeah, some bank said is they estimate five percent. They could be revised around the as well. I mean, I, in my personal opinion, even five percent would be challenging. But even if you get five percent, means say hundred became minus sixteen means uh, eight six. You add five, you still nine to one. So two thousand nineteen hundred is still below. That's why I say per capita GDP is will still be coming down even if you add five. If we were go by 10%, still that is below than what we were earlier. That that is the point there. And on the restriction, uh, I mean, whether those will be uh, eased, I think that that's why my message is that that would could be eased if these policies are changed and if the government goes with a seeker program with the IMF and all the policies are uh, reverse and implement uh, the things that. Those are sustainable. Then, within about a year or time, this person can be gradually relaxed. If, if, if it is not, obviously, you are going to see much more difficult severe restriction. And you, even the people like us doing technological business and engineering all these things, you won't be able to do anything. I and mean, that is where the unfortunate situation is that we won't promote exports. You can't promote exports without importing the goods and services and essential. Yeah. If you don't, it's, it's not that we don't have anything, everything that we can export without importing. You import at value and then export. And your point on the technology, contribution of technology, like engineers, IT, all these people, exports, you're right. If you look at engineers, a lot of people are basically employed in, in the electricity board or the construction of local. It's not the technological in the technological areas that people are basically contributing. If you look at, say, a lot of other countries, say, even India, the software engineers are the ones who are get, you know, earning large amounts of foreign exchange to the country. That is where the, the technology people like yours or engineers can make contributions and, and, and uh, use the technology to increase export earnings for so that government will have to have a proper kind of a, a facilitating uh, environment and proper policy so that you know the people can do business I mean with this kind of restriction no one can do business I mean that is where the, the other point I mean the, you also raised a lot of other you know like really very I mean you your your, uh, your question remained you know included the answer so I think I don't have to <laughs> the, the ones who raise a lot of issues are basically those are all valid. I, I think the only thing is only I can say is that the key message here, if the, the, this course or policies are in a change, then we are going to be in a much more difficult diverse situation. And that and people should get ready for that and going forward. Uh, otherwise, you know, we, we will be in, in, a, in a difficult uh, situation going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor, there is another another question post here. Mm -hmm. uh, in recent times, there has been statement that Sri Lanka should follow MMT, which allows <laughs> a large amount of money to be printed. Yeah, uh, right. And this is okay. Is this policy philosophy consistent with the, the last policy intervention by Central Bank? And there was a, that's a, the, uh, there's a question. And there's another related question, which I say when the politicians say they are taking corrective action, they refer to the SOPs from China as a solution to increase foreign reserves, which you also touched in. Uh, when uh, Central Bank announces the reserve numbers, they say that the SOPs from China is 
uh, excluded. Why <laughs> this discrepancy? Uh, the <laughs> Oh, the certain things I, I don't think I, I it's not right for me to comment although I, I know the answers is as a you know former central banker I should not uh, reveal uh, why that is the case I think that's probably you should ask that question from the government central bank I think the conference or whatever and I, all I know the as based on public information this uh, the stock from China is something uh, which is still uh, probably not available uh, in terms of one is it's available in uh, the Chinese currency one. Other mm -hmm. one, as far as uh, I think the uh, what people have been telling is that that is can be used to import things from China. It's not necessarily uh, you know, money available. That's why that that is not included in the resource. I think that that's the reason why that is not included in the resource. Uh, other one is the uh, modern monetary theory is only a textbook. Uh, one academic wrote this, and that has never been practiced. This is a People are have a misunderstanding that you know the US, Japan are printing a lot of money, and there's no inflation, there's no issue. Uh, as a result, why can't the Central Bank of Sri Lanka print money? I mean, this is a crazy argument. If you understand the US dollar, Japanese yen, they even uh, the sterling Ola, what they call the reserve currency. The, those central banks can print as much as money. And then people are willing to accept those money globally. But if we print the rupees here, do you know anyone abroad who's willing to buy rupees? <laughs> it is a not convertible currency. So if to print rupee as much as rupee, then it will stay in this country. It will go after limited amount of goods and services available, and that will increase the prices. But the dollars printed by all these resource central banks and they print money, large amount of money are flowing all over the world. And it does not stay in the US or stay in those countries. As a result, that has no direct impact in their monetary policy or in, in, in their inflation. That is why the, the privilege is that those are reserve currencies and everyone, people are basically willing to accept globally those as a reserve currency. That's why even if you maintain our resource, we maintain US dollars, sterling, uh, Japanese yen, uh, partly small amount in uh, Chinese currency, likewise, you know, a gold. So those are convertible and globally accepted. But, uh, but we, no one never know, even not in Sri Lanka, but even Bangladesh, Indian rupee, no one keeping that money uh, as part of resource. Because that, those are not, uh, those countries cannot use this what they call modern monetary theory or, or printing money to find a credit without any impact. I mean, that is uh, that's a lack of understanding of uh, the monetary policy or monetary theory. I mean, that's, that's all I can say about okay. those who are arguing in favor yeah. of that. There's another, another question. Uh, uh, it says, if Sri Lanka is declared bankrupt, what's the impact to individual savings? Uh, it's a difficult question. I think I should not, I mean, it's not right for me to comment uh, on that. Question. Yeah, but doctor, in, in, in the case of... Uh, no, basically, the bankrupt means bank uh, is, is, uh, what I meant, meant, meant by here, the government defaulted. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yes. Government defaulted for currency obligation. So it in that means, situation... Uh, in that situation, then the, what will happen basically, then uh, the Sri Lankan banks will not be able to even open an LC with foreign bank because the reputation is that when the government has reported, then banks, then level of banks are one below the sovereign, below the government. If government has not meet obligations, then commercial banks are also not be able to do that. They also will not be able to meet obligation. As a result, even for short-term imports, imports for short-term funding like level of credits also cannot be opened by the bank. Then they can they can import only to the amount that they have cash in dollars. Like us, in a, even now with some difficulty, you still can open LCs if banks if bank is willing to bank and find some currency. Yeah, but in that situation, they don't even be able to open an LC 
if country is, is deported I mean, until yeah, yeah. Was, no, the, the, that is actually the one being experienced now even if even example i can also say that earlier in uh, four years ago fairly small fairly big lc even a one foreign bank uh, was ready to confirm uh, now for the same amount there are, we needed five five banks so because yeah, every yeah. bank yeah. produced the, this thing so we had to go for a five banks to get it reconfirmed it so yeah, that, that is a that's a situation for exporter that's a common situation right now because that as a result i say i mean that that that's no no i mean you have to have the situation when you have a foreign exchange in the country in the banking system or central bank we can have something for instance so that you know that, that, that that's unfortunate the situation and that, yeah. that that's where is going to affect the that's why this five percent growth projected by central bank i still is less likely to believe that because of the, all these assistance country cannot grow even at you know from negative 16 percent another five percent that, that's a that's again a challenge and doctor, there is another question, another two questions. I think it's in line the same thing. And one doctor from Dr. Kamarnath seems these mm -hmm. issues should have been forecasted by the central bank when Sri Lanka was borrowing. I see serious issue on the policy and implementation, policy planning and implementation. So even the debt tree is structured without the policy planning and implementation, will not be able to recover. That is uh, uh, the, in the same line, there is a question from Mr. Hayuru. Um, in general, honesty and the openness to play a major role in solving problems. Central bank uh, and the government hide real numbers and trying to find a way out of the solutions. Politically biased development really caused the problems, not earning revenues. Bankruptcy and then restarting the economy from the stretch will be a solution to this suitable is this suitable so mm -hmm. they, they, i think the both questions are basically on the government yeah, that's planning and implementation <laughs> so uh, yeah. i just read it out and uh, if there are there's another question is there any possibility to control and put the standard rates that each bank can charge from the customers on different services they offer example indian bank do not charge for transfers including the rtgs uh, that uh, I don't know kind of a regulation issue it looks like yeah yeah that's up to the I mean central bank cannot regulate everything right? that's bank businesses and banks different business models some banks for example now if you look at certain banks those they, they are good at foreign exchange business and they offer discounts for foreign exchange business whereas some banks are good at say rupee business or deposits they, they are going after deposits so then they, they are competitive uh, uh, in that business, depending on their business model. Central bank usually do not impose that kind of kind of regulation uh, across the bank on their businesses. Is that whether they, they comply with the road prudential uh, you know the, the regulations? That's all. Uh, you should, uh, that's all of the central bank. I mean, central bank cannot get into. Hey, I mean, right now, I mean, there have been situations central bank has been imposing certain restriction interest rate caps and all these things, but those are not ideal. Uh, I mean, this is not a role of uh, the regulator. Regulator should not be imposing restriction, in my view, on, on their business operation. Okay? That's, that's up to the bank. So depending on their model, business model, some banks can afford it. That's why, as you mentioned, you know, if you want to open LC, you obviously go around the banks and see what, what bank can open the best state. So you go to that bank. Uh, so that's how it works. Yeah, there is uh, another one from Captain Ranjit Veer Singh. Uh, how did it affect the government earning for the exchange when borrowed money was spent to build a totally new harbor in Hambantota? when that could have been used for all terminals in Columbus, Southeast Harbor, and the Western South Terminal. So it's a kind of a observation. Yeah, uh, I, I don't want to comment on the individual project solution because this is all macro yeah. issue. And yes. I already touched yes, on it. And there is another one from one Mr. Chamind Bandara. Thank you for your much for this talk. I would like to seek your comments on the following. Number one, knowing 
money printing is bad why central bank is doing that this is doctor again i also have a little little uh, question on this aren't the, the senior professionals in the central bank is uh, not able to advise the government on this so the same question is there and the uh, why central bank is giving a bogus exchange but that is uh, the, the, that yeah. is uh, what you, you mentioned about it why government is not seeking imf i think they are doing it now hmm. uh, so i think the the question out of those three is basically uh, the the professionals we know that central bank has a very highly academic and highly uh, qualified personnel so uh, this uh, controlling of the money printing is in that uh, uh, done uh, with the advisor so what is the i don't know whether you can react no, say I, anything I think that, basically yeah. i i can't uh, i mean I, i can't do a direct answer to that because being a central bank i should not i mean, still i can say i have very high regard for professionals in the central bank they are very knowledgeable exactly and, uh, yeah. they, they are basically uh, i mean concerned about all these issues but it is all i mean the, uh, i draw one analogy here i mean the problem of central bank for example just look at the pandemic and the the health sector professionals so the health sector professionals openly they or internally and the externally openly and the internally they have been given advice as regards so does that mean i mean it is the the government take advice from different all kind of sources including health sector professionals including politicians including some other people and it is up to the government to make a decision on whom whose advice they i mean they are going to take or they are going to accept it, it, it's a responsibility of you know central bank certainly has a responsibility of giving advice to the monetary board to the minister of finance that that uh, that is the statutory obligation as far as i know that that has to happen by the law that that is happen but it doesn't mean that you know all that does i mean i i don't also think that he, as a government they should not uh, i mean most likely i'm they, they should not take 100% central bank advice and that work they have to listen to lot of other people as well Uh, it is is up to the authority who is the authority to make decision is the parliament uh, is the cabinet is the government mm. so who will have to make a decision and i'm, i'm sure they are getting uh, at best various advice from various people mm. so then it's the uh, ability of the administration to take all the advice and make select or make the right decisions uh, that is the process that will ever happen i mean So if that is happening or not, I don't know. I mean, I can't comment on that because that's internal thing. I, 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 I mean, I have some experience uh, in my career, but I should not talk about those things uh, once I come out. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> the, Dr. Kavanath is raising hand. Dr. Kavanath, you may uh, speak. I, I asked the, the question, but uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Veer Singh. And my question was now, uh, as I mentioned, the... We, we we know that um, the central government is central bank is uh, advice in the government but um, in order to be successful this uh, planning and implementation has to happen so is it not a part of the central bank or is it is happening outside the central bank so that because now even we invest and even we uh, uh, we start with the the debts if you are not uh, focused towards uh, increasing the, the production uh, within the uh, country we won't be able to successfully become successful so policy planning and implementation needs to be made yeah i mean the, yeah, that's a that's a good question i think let me uh, clarify this uh, role of central bank uh, in general the, even under the central bank law monetary act central bank has the is a financial advisor to the government and also there are certain certain obligations that central bank can do Economic advice also like before the budget, just what they call September 15 report. That's a conventional report. Central bank will go to the level submit to the government before the budget, given the overall macro situation and these are the policies that government should they they, they recommend. Central bank recommends. Uh, 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 basically, that's the only advisory role. 
so the implementation is there that's why it is a number of ministries okay say in terms of implementation of health sector this is a ministry of health central bank cannot intervene in that education is a ministry of education the power sector is so far that's why it is a democratic system people elect this uh, this ministers all these people and that's they are and parliament authority uh, is to implement policies all these things are different the central bank can't do that the central bank should not have that way actually central bank uh, uh, main role of the central bank is to maintain what i call economic and price stability in our central bank and also financial system stability which means control stable economic economic growth and inflation one other one is to to maintain a stable financial system like the banking system non bank system when i think there's other question that you ask about the companies uh, reporting banks reporting something wrong that is not the central even that's not the central bank it's a, there is a separate regulator for that that is the securities and exchange commission that those things coming under that regulator the central bank cannot intervene there also. so i think here the misunderstanding in lot of people they know Sri Lanka Central Bank means Central Bank should be doing everything. It's not Central Bank has a very limited role by the law. It's to maintain inflation and stable economic growth and the financial stability. In addition, there are certain agency functions like uh, on behalf of the government, the, we 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 do the uh, uh, debt management for the government, the EPF management, uh, the currency management. Those are the agency functions. Uh, uh, then payment and settlement are under financial system stability. Likewise, these are the things that are given to the central bank. The central bank can't do anything beyond. I mean, see, there is a plan department of planning within the treasury. There is a ministry of plan implementation earlier, but now there is no ministry. But still, you know, there are several other government organizations. You now, the under different laws uh, for those purposes, so they will have to take on the whole. We can only give advice, very simple. Man. There is, uh, I think, Doctor. We can may probably take another one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, I will say they should say any advisory. Should should any advisory board externally whistle blow if the government is not taking relevant advice, especially as a crisis situation? So. Ranjit yeah. Kamani has asked this question. So, uh, I don't know whether right. that kind of statement. No way in the world, like I, as far as I know, this you know, uh, external advice it goes to the other countries with a doing the right thing or wrong thing. That's I think the sovereignty of country is that you know mm. that that should be uh, you know, respected. I think it's, there should not be external uh, parties monitoring us and saying that we should not be doing that. Uh, this is different from I am. I mean, it's a it's a is that quite at best we are getting not that they they are this kamani i think uh, you can uh, you are raising your hand maybe yeah actually what i meant was now if the government is not taking uh, that advice shouldn't the central bank uh, expose that to the people or like uh, uh, what i meant by external whistle blowing should the uh, central bank say now uh, uh, according to the information that you were showing from a long time we have been like um, not doing the correct thing right so then we should predict that we are not going on the correct path so if the government is not taking that advice should the central bank uh, say to the public or you know like let the others know that this is happening i mean yeah, i think that, that's yeah. a good point yeah i think i understand the point i, I mean if you look at central bank has that responsibility that's to where the the statute of central bank report annual report of the central bank that's uh, that's by the law central bank should mm -hmm. submit this report to the public and also submit to the parliament if you read carefully the all the annual reports of the central bank and especially that report contains and also highlights what are the right things what how say for example in the financial year what has gone wrong why that was not achieved what are the issues and even going forward outlook recommendation policies and i would invite you to read the chapter 1 of the annual reports throughout if you read that you can see what to suggest is there only problem is that you know, it's not that you know everyone can understand it's a highly technical language a lot of people 
find it difficult to understand what we say unless the economists, you know, they're basically talking with that. You know, we all are economists. You know, we, we, we write in a, or speak in a language. That's why even now I find it uh, difficult to explain certain things to the general public, you know, people who don't have economic knowledge. That's why it took a lot of pain and time to explain certain simple things. And you can't do that in an annual report, you know, because there's annual central bank obligation to the public and also to the parliament. Uh, so this is where, and if you read that report, I mean, certainly you will see a lot of, even under any government, such any government, the central bank has maintained that the independence in a lot of years uh, has, has expressed, and it's not that, you know, they are pointing because when the government did not do that, why, you know, it's not that, you know, it's a certain language, it is all there. Okay, Doctor. So, thank you so much. Uh, thank and you so have much. A few, more, few more questions, and uh, also thank for the people who asked the questions and interview uh, involved uh, very, very enthusiastically. And uh, obviously, you know, we have uh, uh, three times more public uh, sector employees from 2005 to 2020. Yeah. <laughs> so, this this talks. Uh, the one of the aspect of that and the continuous uh, uh, growth uh, or yeah. limited growth and uh, less exports, all these things are converging into a situation and with all this kind of uh, sudden pandemic and loss of tourism and we, we, we will not uh, be able to uh, enough inertia to take any hit in the economy side. So uh, so that has uh, brought this. Anyway, once again, thank you so much for your very uh, valuable yeah. and informative. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. The small thing I want to uh, tell finally is, it, is the pandemic is common to all countries. But this situation is only very few countries like mm. Sri Lanka and a couple of countries. It's not, and you can't say because of the pandemic we have this issue. Pandemic is a common, like India is worse than here, even Bangladesh is worse than here. Yeah. But they don't have that kind of thing. Yeah. So, thank uh, you very much. Yeah. So, uh, thank you once again. And uh, uh, Dr. Buddhika. Yes. Yeah. So, then we will conclude this uh, moderating session with this now. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, so uh, before winding up, uh, uh, before delivering the vote of thanks, uh, I would like to uh, uh, ask one last question, <laughs> Dr. Nandala, uh, sure. that uh, in your very first chart, you showed that in 1978, uh, it was a very high uh, economic yeah. growth. Mm. And then it never came to that level. So, do you think the liberalization worked for our country? I don't. So the know. liberalization, um, obviously, mm -hmm. I and mean, if you compare the non non liberalized period, quality of even, life, yes, maybe. Yeah, quality of life also. I mean, if you compare, if you can, I don't know that. I mean, mm. if you can remember the standard way of living, standard of life before 1977 and after 1977, mm -hmm. it's completely. I mean, there's a Drastic difference, and we always have to agree and accept that you know the quality of living, standard of living has gone up in far in the, the world. world. Yes, I mean, the, and also uh, the before 1977 difficulties that people have been facing with post economy non liberalized mm -hmm. and uh, restriction, like what we are now is what we had been before 77. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are so again I mean, proposing to do the same. So to uh, increase yeah, that, now we have no choice, and that's not just because of the restriction. I mean, for instance, the, the, difficulty the, to import. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's that's what is happening right now. <laughs> the, it's cycle, no? Life is a cycle. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, to wind up the session, I would like to thank my special thanks go to Dr. Nandalal Veerasinghe. Uh, for accepting my personal invitation on behalf of FIFA and uh, taking your valuable time to prepare this uh, very interesting uh, presentation uh, uh, to uh, explain us in an uh, understandable language that is very important because uh, as engineers and uh, 
academics we all should know these things not only that all the citizens should be aware of it so lucky yes. uh, we had even tv uh, telecasting this so it was uh, open to public as well so uh, we, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking your time uh, to give us this uh, opportunity and then uh, to all the participants actually we see less number today in zoom because uh, many joined to uh, po tv uh, so anyway uh, we have lot of uh, people watching this so thank you very much all the participants through uh, zoom uh, live online as well as uh, to even tv and uh, thank you very much uh, even tv uh, for giving us this uh, opportunity to telecast also uh, uh, at last not least uh, i want to thank all our committee members especially the subcommittee organizing uh, this talk series uh, dr samit buddhika dr damayanti and uh, uh, engineer marikar uh, ms leka so all of them uh, took lot of time organizing this so thank you very much all uh, thank you very much uh, i we will end the session now thank you thank you, thank you. 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 Th